markets promising to set the cat among the pigeons with its controversial take on the men who run Indian cricket and by doing so also call the shots in world cricket now. James Astle, the author of uh, The Great Tamasha, Cricket, Corruption and the Turbulent Rise of Modern India joins us now. Thank you very much, uh, James, for speaking to NDTV. Now, you make some very sharp comments about the BCCI and the czars of the game. They're overwhelming influence on uh, world cricket. Is this just India's financial clout or something that runs a little deeper? 80% we hear of the total revenues that are generated in cricket are generated in India. This has given India's cricket administrators not an absolute final say, not a, not, not a, not a dictatorial uh, writ over cricket, but something quite close to that. What India wants in cricket it will get and that is not always um, for the good of the global game, I argue in my book. Now you talk uh, about the balance of power in the world in world cricket shifting to the east. Um, you date it specifically to the run-up to the 1996 uh, World Cup, uh, which perhaps coincided with an incredible surge of interest in the game in South Asia, with channels who were interested in pumping money into telecast rights, big advertising money, the works. But you also say that you think that's been very detrimental for the game, for world cricket in the long run. And why is that? They're absolutely right that the game was dominated by England and Australia in that way. And of course, they were arrogant often, they, they took others for granted and they wanted their own way and they behaved badly in many ways. But I think it was very clear that with all that, there was a sense of the long-term and global good of the game. And I'm not sure that India's administrators, the men of the BCCI, India's politicians who don't have much of a good reputation in their day jobs always have the good of the, the game globally and in the long term um, at heart. Now, you talk about England and Australia having that sort of power uh, before now the balance of power clearly shifting. Is there a, you know, a little bit of envy perhaps in that assessment that it is India that calls the shots now when it comes to who plays cricket and when they play cricket? So I don't think there is envy and I don't think there's any real sense of competition. But there is undeniably a sense of resentment that where England uh, could determine the course of cricket and felt that it did that rather well, um, there's still this sense that um, cricket is really a, a rather English game, isn't it? India now takes that leading role. So un undeniably there is some resentment, uh, not very noble, uh, and I think there's a little bit of self-denial amongst many British critics of the way that India runs cricket. Well, I think that's quite honest. But you do paint India as the sort of big bully of world cricket. And you think the BCCI's management of the IPL is perhaps where this bullying tendency is demonstrated the most. In particular, the, we can look at the way that the IPL has been managed, uh, their willingness to cannibalise the playing squads of other international um, uh, teams, especially the West Indies, where um, the national side has been weakened enormously because the best players are playing in the IPL. And India, which doesn't let its players go and play T20 abroad, is perfectly happy about that. That is a very irresponsible um, track to go down. It suggests that India really only cares about its own game, doesn't care about global cricket. That is a profound shift in the consensual international culture of cricket, which is really one of its most unique and attractive qualities. Now, let's speak, up, speak about some of the individual cricketing czars that you write about. You describe Sharad Pawar rather interestingly as a patchy of Indian politics. Uh, tell us a little more about that interview with him. I wouldn't rush to judgment uh, of Mr. Pawar, not least because he's a very difficult man to read. He's inscrutable. His, his, uh, uh, he, he's a man with his fingers in, in many pies. There, are, uh, constant, there is a constant churn of, of, of rumours about him, uh, some of them scurrilous. Um, it's very difficult to know what the truth of any of them is or if there's any truth uh, in any of them. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't hasten to, to jump to conclusions about Mr. Power, but I read his press and I listen to what he had to say and I give a sense of that in my book. But you also describe Lalit Modi as the Icarus of cricket, the figure in Greek mythology who flew too close to the sun, burnt his wings in the process. Do you believe there's a moral in that story, in the, in the spectacular rise and fall of Lalit Modi? My phrase uh, 
for, for Lalit that he was the Icarus of Indian cricket, I think is, is suitably ambitious. Lalit, Lalit is a man who uh, has many, many gifts. He, he did a brilliant entrepreneurial job, uh, as has been widely recognized in, bring, in growing the IPL very, very quickly from a standing start into the enormously spectacular and successful tournament that it almost instantly was, but he upset an awful lot of people and he's accused of behaving very badly in the process. And he got burnt and he fell to earth and he landed with a bit of a thump. He landed with a bit of a thump indeed. But when it comes to the issue of match fixing, spot fixing, you're actually surprisingly optimistic. You interviewed a bookie who said fixing was all pervasive, but you don't believe uh, that's true. Tell us a little more uh, about that bookie you met uh, near Dongri. Uh, you seem to describe it as rather a chilling experience. There is too much of a shadow of truth of, over it for us to, to dismiss it altogether. We know that there has, there's been a great deal of corruption in cricket. We know that there's been match fixing. Um, we're seeing another such scandal so depressingly in the IPL at the moment. And therefore, I couldn't dismiss what this bookie had to say. And as we ended our conversation, I, I said to him, you know, what, 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 you know what, if your bosses knew that you were talking to a Western writer in this way, wouldn't that be dangerous for you? And he just pointed to his neck. And I thought, oh, this is some Bollywood rubbish. And then I looked closer. And he had a scar from here to here with stitch marks in it where his throat had been cut. And he said, I was in trouble with them before. So it's a dangerous game.